This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. How bad is the national debt? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason associate editor and author of the Reason Roundup. Hey there, Liz. Hey, Zach. Our national debt, measured as federal debt held by the public, is over $27 trillion. That's approaching 100% of annual GDP, so the size of the entire U.S. economy, higher than it's been since the end of World War II. So are we screwed? Or are those of us who worry about charts like that totally misunderstanding the nature of government debt? There's a school of thought called Modern Monetary Theory, or MMT, that says economists should stop worrying and learn to love the debt because when you think about it, the government's deficit is a private sector surplus. That's what MMTers believe. Joining us to talk about the debt, the arguments and rising influence of MMT, and the likely trajectory of an increasingly debt-burdened country is Bob Murphy. He's an economist and author, senior fellow at the Mises Institute and host of the Bob Murphy Show and the Human Action Podcast. Bob, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Glad to be here. Let's start by looking at that debt slide again. Uh, you know, Even how we measure the debt can be controversial because you can measure total public debt, which is approaching $35 trillion and already over that 100% debt to GDP ratio. Or what we're going with here is debt held by the public, and that excludes money that the government owes to itself, so-called intragovernmental debt, which puts us at about $27.5 trillion. And in either case, you can see that debt has skyrocketed uh, since the 2008 financial crisis, and then the bailouts that followed, and then, of course, it just went vertical with all the pandemic spending. When you look at this chart, Bob, what's the economic story it tells you? Well, yeah, just to touch on that distinction you made, for because uh, people, when they look this, these things up, they see the different numbers. So that the yeah. debt that the government owes to itself, as it were, you know, some of that is the so-called Social Security Trust Fund. And so I want to make sure people understand that, you know, there's, it's not merely like, oh, it's just, it just all nets out. And it's not a big deal that in many contexts, right? So what's been happening is before when there were surpluses, when workers were paying in more to Social Security than was going out to beneficiaries. The government was still spending that money, right? It wasn't like they were investing it in you know, corporate securities or something. And then it was they were just basically giving an IOU to the Social Security Trust Fund or administration, right? So it, in terms of the accounting, it just I would say, you know, people need to be consistent. And so the problem is in some contexts, economists like Paul Krugman or whoever who like to like poo-poo the debt mongers will say, oh, no, don't be looking at the total figure, which, as you say, is above $35 trillion at this point. Look at the mm-hmm. you know, debt held by the public. And that's fine. But then when they're talking about Social Security, they should say, if that's what they're going to do, then say, okay, right now they're already underwater, right? They're already, you know, since, uh, you know, several years ago, they're not, there's a deficit right there. But then usually the people saying, don't worry, we still have time to deal with these crises will flip. And all of a sudden the Social Security Trust Fund is a genuine asset. No, I mean, they they hold it if, you know, if private corporations held in social uh, treasuries, you would count that as an asset, right? So, it's again yeah. a lot you can't of times have it both ways. right inconsistency, yeah. but yeah, big picture there. Uh, you're you're right that it's obviously you know very high. It's above 100 percent, even if you just focus on the debt held by the public. It, and economists like to use that metric because that's more apples to apples with different countries around the world. They you know because they have different systems in, in terms of state programs that they do. So the debt by, held by the public as a share of the economy is typically what economists use when they're trying to do different. Uh, 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 countries compared to each other. And yeah, that's about 100% at this point. And in many cases, people say like that's sort of a, a tipping point, if you will, that you know usually when countries go above that level, it's hard to come back from that. And it's true in the US, there was precedent with World War II, but there, you know, putting aside what one's views are about foreign policy and what the government ought to be doing, but that was clearly driven by a one-off emergency where, hey, the US government was going to get into this world war spend a bunch of money through deficit finance and, you know, money printing. But then over, you know, they ran some surpluses immediately after. And of course, spending was much lower and that allowed the U.S. to grow out of that. Whereas right now, there's nothing analogous. It's not that even though those numbers did spike because of COVID and the financial crisis, 
it's not as if there's smooth sailing ahead. Like the CBL projects debt held by the public will rise to 166% of GDP over the next 30 years, right? Not, not building in any crises, just as interest rates trend back towards a more normal level. So that's one of the huge differences between like the World War II, you know, immediate post-war era and now is there's no way we can just kind of turn down the dials and say, okay, now that we got those crises out of the way, we can get back on solid footing. No, we can't. It's going to be painful no matter what they do at this point. How did this amount of government spending become politically feasible throughout the 2010s? Like, was there something in our the way we look at, at government, at, at the national debt and look at government spending? Is there something that changed circa 2009, 2010, where we just suddenly became really accustomed to this idea that, you know, money printer go burn, government spending yeah. go up? Like what happened? Sure. So I just to remind you guys, uh, you know, when George Bush was still in office and then but the economy started, you know, uh, cratering and they had a they, they gave like a refund check or something like, that. you know, it was like a, a gimmicky yeah. thing. And I don't remember off the top of my head what the number was, but it was in like the hundreds of billions, not too high. And people were freaking out like, geez, that's kind of a big price tag. And then when Obama came in and had his so-called stimulus package, I remember the debates at the time and it came in and it was a high number, but they wanted to keep it under a trillion. I remember because it was still like, you you know, you go over the, you know, the T word people. Are, but once we broke through that psychologically, you know, people just got used to that as being the new normal. But to answer your question, Liz, I think there was two things. One is that interest rates were so low, like they were, yeah. you know, in terms of short term treasury debt, were like basically zero percent for like seven years there that it, you know, it's kind of like if you're getting credit card offers to keep rolling it over to zero percent APR for an introductory 12 months or something that. You can be getting plasma screen TVs or whatever it is that you know people buy them nowadays, and it doesn't it doesn't hurt. It feels free. But so everybody, long. but everybody yeah. knows whether they're the individual consumer or the federal government. Everybody knows that the low interest rate environment is not going to stay that way for forever, right? Like, is there this inability to anticipate, like, hey, 10, 15 years down the road, this interest rate environment will be different? So I think one thing that happened, and I was guilty of this myself, is some of us were freaking out when they, you know, when the Federal Reserve's balance sheet blew up. I don't know if you guys, if this was on your rib, but like Glenn Beck was like on a forklift on his, when he had a TV show and yes. everything was going up and everything. And, and I, you know, and, and so some of it, and people were throwing around the word, I didn't say hyperinflation myself, but people were throwing those words around pretty casually. And so then when that didn't happen, you know, as of 2012 and the world didn't end and gas wasn't $20 a gallon, I think a lot of people were saying, no, 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 you guys are just chicken littles. And also Liz, to your point yeah. that there was this issue. Well, gee, we just, you know, this could have been the next Great Depression if the government hadn't come in and spent all this money. That's what people were were telling us. And sure. so I think there was this idea that, no, no, we're going to return to normal. We're just going to get things under control. And so there was always no reason to cut spending in the next six months. And then that just kept dragging on and on and on. And then once, well, gee, the Democrats spent a bunch of money. So then why shouldn't we? And there's COVID. And da -da -da -da. Yeah. so it's, I think it was Something like that. I don't know if it's I'm like answering your question. They, yeah, no, that does answer it well. It's almost like government spending and our political culture has become this thing that's been very beautifully portrayed as um, the thing, the bulwark against calamity, the thing that saves us from an awful situation, whether it's in the form of stimulus checks or to, you know, sold as something that sort of staves off the next Great Depression. But like at a certain point, this surely won't be true, right? Like, right. This and also, you know, a, a qualitative difference between like the private household and the government is if it's yourself and you're running up big credit card debt, you know, and having fancy parties and everybody, you know, you're a real popular guy or whatever because you're having this At some point, you know that you're going to have to pay for that down the road. Whereas if you're in the office, you, you know, you're not going to be the president for much longer and your party might not even. So th there's just much less, you know, there's a diffusion of responsibility and idea of you know, live it up while you're in control of this apparatus of the state and then somebody else is going to deal with it down the road. So just the incentives are a lot different because you can curry favor with people. Then you retire and you're going around giving speeches and getting, you know, nice plush uh, positions and so forth once you're out of office. So there is this weird dynamic where, yeah, you, you want to spend when you're in office, not tax if you don't have to, because that's painful. People don't like that. And then once you get out, hey, it's not our fault and we can just blame. Well, gee, you guys spent it on the military or you you gave t tax cuts to corporations. Why don't you fix the budget? So in back in April of 2021, I talked uh, about debt with Jason Furman. Uh, so the, I would talk to him. Th this was in the early days of the Biden administration when all the spending was being passed, the trillions of dollars. Um, and Furman it was the Harvard economist who served as Obama's 
Council of Economic Advisors chair, one of the main guys battling against all you chicken little saying, you know, you got to stop talking about hyperinflation, inflation, it's all the spending is going to be fine. Um, You know, Biden's so so like for full context, when I was the moment I was talking to him, uh, Biden's first one point six trillion had had been passed and the next one point eight, I believe, was being debated. Um, And I asked him if it would have been better if we would have been in a better position if the government had followed the recommendations of the Simpson Bowles Commission in the 2010s. And so these were the debt hawks who were saying, mm-hmm. we're going to be in trouble if we don't pay down the debts. Uh, and I'd love to hear your reaction, Bob, to what he said in reply to me. Uh, John, could you roll that clip? After Democrats were walloped in the midterm elections, President Obama established the Simpson Bowles Commission, which concluded that disaster was inevitable unless we cut spending, raised taxes, and reformed entitlements. It's going to destroy our country from within if we don't face up to it and face up to it quickly. And Washington is learning that, and boy, they are learning it fast. The commission's recommendations were never adopted. Its critics say that that's a good thing. If the Simpson Bowles had been adopted, we would have been chronically short of demand in the years that followed its adoption. The unemployment rate would have been higher, growth would have been lower. And when we went into the COVID crisis, we would have gone in with a lower inflation rate, lower interest rates, and thus even less scope for maneuver. There was nothing about the US debt level going into the COVID crisis that created any constraint on the resources available to fight the crisis. The United States was able to borrow an enormous amount, not just the United States. Japan, which has a higher debt level, was able to borrow an enormous amount. So I don't think there's any relationship between the debt level you went into the crisis and your ability to handle and manage the crisis. So uh, basically, he's saying if we listen to the hawks, our economy, uh, the debt hawks, our economy would not have recovered as well in the 2010s. uh, And actually, low inflation would have been bad. Uh, So was he right and you were wrong? Or, you know, what is, you know, what's happened since then? How does that change the light of those comments? Okay, so, you know, for the listeners, so there, he's clearly coming at things from a Keynesian perspective. And so, yeah, yes. like the average person just hearing that might have thought, wait, did he did he say that backwards? That's saying, yeah, I mean, we, we would have gone, <laughs> had we listened to those knuckleheads, we would have gone in the COVID crisis with a lower inflation rate and lower interest rates. And, you know, a lot of people might think, wouldn't that have been better? Like, you know, in other words, we're getting hit with the lockdowns. And on top of that, we have higher inflation and higher interest rates. How does that, but where he's coming from is to say, oh, because from the Fed's point of view, if the way they help the economy is by cutting rates, then the higher the rate is going into it, the more room you have to cut. Okay, so even on its own terms, I don't really think that that makes much sense. But put, putting that aside, just the more fundamental problem I have with that is that I don't think you're doing the economies any favor by cutting interest rates. Right from an Austrian perspective, that's what causes the boom bust cycle. Uh, you know, so it's, it's not that we're all of a sudden richer if the Federal Reserve just starts printing money, which in the short term, you know, pushes down short term interest rates. So I mean, I, I disagree with them both, you know, in terms of strategy and tactics, as it were. But I, I will say, again, kind of circling back to what Liz said earlier, the, the problem with like the, you know, these deficit commissions and whatnot, and they come out with very stern warnings is if they're saying really bad things are going to happen and it doesn't happen next Tuesday, you could say, oh, so you guys said it was a problem. You know I mean? I, I don't know if there were people warning against using hydrogen for blimps before disaster struck, but, you know, I, I can imagine people saying, oh, nothing happened so far. Anytime you're pointing at something and saying, this is a bad idea, that disaster could ensue. If it doesn't happen right away, then you end up looking like, you know, chicken little. So I think that was part of the issue. But I will say, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like right now, the, the government spent more on interest than on the military in the last, you know, fiscal year. That was something yeah. that would have been inconceivable 20 years ago. All right. That it's, uh, so I, I just, there's figures about saying how much of net tax revenue is now being devoted to just interest on the debt. Okay, so a lot of yeah, this, this stuff. Is the, this is the interest graph that I just pulled up here as a, as an expenditure. You can see again going vertical over a trillion dollars. And yeah, as you mentioned, it's the yeah. second item here in U.S. government spending for uh, fiscal year to date, twenty twenty four. There's Social Security, twenty two percent, and then uh, yeah, interest payment, fourteen percent above health and 
Medicare and yes. defense. And I think national defense uh, is like 13 or something. I can't see. Yep. Yeah, that's so. Much. So again, I mean, these things are stuff that, you know, had they said this 15, 20 years ago, this would have been projections on a CBO chart that I think a lot of people like Furman would have dismissed and said, well, yeah, that's if we do nothing. But no, we've got this one shot emergency. Let's get through this. And then we're going to have higher growth because we, you know, made these investments in infrastructure and education and, duh, 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 and keep maintaining workers wages. And you don't want to have a downward spiral like in the 30. Right. So again, with all these things are sort of counterfactuals. Let me just say the Obama economist so here is Furman himself wasn't guilty, but it was uh, Christina Romer and Jared Bernstein were the ones, you know, advising the, you know, on the CEA at the time going into it. And they said that the Obama stimulus, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they were warning if we don't pass this, unemployment is going to rise to a certain level. If we do pass it, we'll contain the rise of unemployment. So they did pass the Obama stimulus package and unemployment went above what they were warning would happen if we do yes. nothing. And then double respond, digit. Yeah. And so how did they respond? Did they say, oh, gee, maybe we were wrong? No, they just said, wow, the economy was in worse shape than we thought. It's really good we passed that stimulus. And then on the flip end, it was the other way around when they had the so-called austerity measures that the Republicans were pushing in again during the Obama years. Uh, they had like uh, Mark Zandi, who's, you know, a Keynesian forecaster in the private sector. And he was warning that, oh, hey, if they do this, the you know, GDP growth, and it was a similar pattern where they were warning if they put through this, you know, austerity program from the Republicans, then GDP growth is going to be this terrible amount. If we maintain it, you know, then it'll be a certain amount. So they did get the austerity and GDP growth was higher than what Zandi said would happen if we don't have this crazy austerity measure. And again, they were so, well, well, fortunately, the economy was in better shape than we realized when Republicans pushed. So my point is just it's taking like a step. unfalsifiable. Right. And right. the other thing, too, there are plenty of examples. You know, there's like think tanks who are putting out examples of countries where they were in a bad, you know, having a bad economy and they cut spending as a way to get their deficits under control. And they did just fine. Right. So typically what happens, I would argue, is hmm. you see a lot of these examples of, hey, when countries try to solve their debt problem, they just end up you know, get it worsening their economy and it's a self-defeating process. Yeah, that's it's what they, you always hear is that austerity causes recessions, right? right? And, but it's because they jack up taxes as part of, maybe they cut spending mm. too, but yeah, if yeah. you just instead look at those cases where the government's primarily cut spending, then they're fine typically, right? Which again, mm. accords with like a free market perspective that yeah, raising taxes is the way to help an economy. But if you cut government spending and release those resources to the private sector, that's the key. Is there a corollary between, on the right, the concerns about, and I'm sort of lumping libertarians in with the right for the purposes of this analogy, um, but between the right being very concerned about when the bill comes due with uh, government debt and a sense that like there is um, economic ruin headed our way, but we don't quite know when it will hit, and the sort of like leftist... Um, apocalyptic way of looking at like environmental calamity where they feel the sense of like, you know, and we don't know the timeline uh, at which this will become a problem, but we know that it will become a problem. Um, the the problem is like the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is like it's impossible to make the other side begin to care about this issue. And it's certainly right. impossible to make both sides agree on what the solution is to rein it in and to stave off, to ward off that disaster. Um, what do you think about that analogy? Does that make sense thinking in political terms? And is there any way to like, is there any political hope for any of this getting reined in and uh, being thought about in a sensible way? Yeah, I think there's a great analogy there. And I actually had some fun with this, you know, during the Obama years, Liz, because again, for people, I had been one of the ones very concerned about the rounds of QE. And mm -hmm. then it looked like, oh, see, nothing happened. I guess you're an idiot. And so I was taking the left's rhetoric because this was also a period where there was like a pause in global warming. And so yeah. I was taking the way yeah. that leftists were dealing with that. And so I would say stuff like the highest CPI on record. And yet we still have the inflation deniers, right? Because that was how they were handling, you know, every time, even if CPI only went up a smidgen, then I would say it's, it's the highest on record. This is crazy, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> How can we keep dumping all of this base money in and not expect that to you know mess with our this it's complex? Also, yeah, it's also interesting, right? Because both have to do with existential ruin, right? I mean, if our environment around us falls, we cannot go on. Frankly, if our financial system around us falls, we also cannot go. On. Like if our economy is in the shitter and there's no way. I mean, look at what Argentina is dealing with right now, or any sort of like hyperinflationary environment, or Venezuela. Like these things really are truly existential threats. 
But like, yeah, so what is the way of getting a sort of maybe not political consensus in terms of figuring out how to approach this issue, but political will from those on the other side to at least admit that it's a problem? Right. So I, I guess, the, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but in, the, in terms of someone might say, okay, yeah, maybe Murphy, you showed that, you know, the other side was hypocrites, but then by symmetry is not your side. And so right. part of it is that, that, yeah, certainly one needs to have humility. And if you were making you know specific predictions mm-hmm. that didn't come true mm-hmm. at the very least, yeah. not try to dodge that and d- do things like, say, well, actually, you know, the, the Fed's inflating so much, we would expect interest sure. rates to go to zero. Like, I mean, I saw some people saying things like that, that where they were kind of using the left similar thing about there's so much global warming that that's why there's cooling now. You know, they're mm-hmm. saying stuff like literally, you know, that that way that there's cold fronts coming in because of so much global ch- climate change. So, uh, you know, just to, like not just always coming up with some way to win the argument, but to step yeah. back, I would say. But again, more fundamentally, yeah, these are complex systems. You know, the, the globe's climate is a very complex system, and that's why I think it's hard to model it. Uh, and that's what I personally still believe that, yeah, giving resources to the political class and letting them allocate them is not the way to promote prosperity. Right. And I think, you know, deficit spending is a way to allow politicians to spend more than they otherwise would be able to get the public to agree to. And so that's, you know, so it, it's not that borrowing per se is bad. It's really the government spending that I think misallocates resources. But when you give them the avenue, the option of running up the debt, that will let them get away with more spending than if they had to, quote, pay for it now uh, or by you know resorting to the printing press. So that to me, I'm, I think it's a much more solid foundation to say that, whereas the stuff with climate change to me, I, I'm not denying climate change. I'm just saying, though, you know, I worked in that area for a lot and a lot of the things just just to give you one example, William Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize for his work on the economics of climate change. That same weekend, the U.N. released its special report on limiting global warming to one point five degrees Celsius. Nordhaus's own work shows that would be such a draconian target. It would be better if the world did nothing than try to hit that target. And yet that yeah. didn't come up in The New York Times interviews. I think I'm in yes. a sense like an MMT person, but with the yeah. environment, with the climate, uh, because I'm as a surfer, I actually really like global warming because it makes the water <laughs> temperatures a little bit better for this surfing New Yorker, <laughs> like right, you're right. So it's like I acknowledge the problem, but I, in fact, welcome it yes. and want more of it. In for turbulence. Yeah. In yeah. the same way that the MMT people are like government spending. Why? Yes. How about some more yeah. of that, please? And it's like, yeah, no, it's like and- a wrong takeaway. <laughs> We're we're gonna t- and we're gonna talk about MMT in just a second. I want to ask you though, k- keeping this this global warming analogy going and the the humility of approaching a dynamic system. But by, by the way, it's funny you mentioned William Nordhaus. We had Ted Nordhaus, who is his mm-hmm. nephew, on the show, and we'll link that show in Such the comments. Good- um, who was uh, bringing a lot of humility to uh, the mo- the models, the climate models, yes. um, ju- and also pointing out the data showing, you know, when you look at things like climate deaths, uh, they're down dramatically, historically. So you always have to, you know, you have to bring in a, uh, every nuance to a conversation like that when you're talking about something so complex. So like keeping all that in mind that you know, forecasting anything happening is going to be difficult, if not un- impossible. What are the biggest risks that you are at the front of your mind uh, carrying this level of debt? If if like there's a tipping point for uh, global warming, if, you know, 100 percent debt to GDP ratio is some sort of tipping point for debt, um, like what what are some of the things that you're most worried about in the short to medium term? Sure. So, you know, it, it, there's nothing magical. I, you know, that's more of a statistical thing that people yeah. people looking. And I, I know there's you know, you're probably going to get swarmed in the comments about there's alleged debunkings of all that stuff and whatever. But but yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's there's not something magical about, oh, this is the precipice. And I want you to go step over. You're done. It's just it's the same thing. And I know we're going to get to MMT in a minute that yeah. it, it's not in my view, it's not wrong to think of debt first, like at a household or corporate level and then understand how that works. So, you know, there can be productive uses of debt, right? Like if a, if a local government wants to build a bridge and they don't want to just tax people right now to pay for the whole thing out, up front, instead they want to issue bonds and then retire them over the course of 20 years as they're using tolls from the bridge to pay it. To, you know, there's nothing crazy about that, given that you think the government ought to be running a bridge. Okay. But again, what we're doing lately is more just, you know, piling up and it's even like structurally that the the spending programs, like, you know, Medicare and social security, it's just with the demographic shifts, it just doesn't work. And that's yeah. not even the official numbers we just talked about. You know, those are the so-called unfunded 
liabilities that are only kind of working in, you know, year by year as the, as the spending accrues, right? So the, the actual situation in terms of the promises Uncle Sam has made versus the likely tax receipts over the next 50 years or what have you, there's a huge imbalance there beyond just what the official, you know, treasury debt would, would indicate. So I think that that's really the issue. And my, my so my concern to answer your question, Zach, is that again, given that you want the government to do anything, just like with a private household that, oh, well, what's the problem if we run up a debt? Well, then given whatever our income is from our job and you know assets and whatever, that means next year and going forward, we don't get to spend that on food and yeah. housing and whatever. We The more we just are paying to interest expense. So the same thing happens here. Like we said, it's right now 14% of total outlays is just interest on previously issued debt. So that's just going to keep uh, uh, you know growing. But beyond that, my concern is that ultimately the way they're going to fix it is just printing money. And so like, because that's going to seem like yeah. a, a, the, the only solution that's going to make sense. And so that's just, you know, going to cause large amounts of price inflation, which, you know, has its own consequences. Well, what speaking you, of just endlessly printing well, money. Oh, sorry, Liv, go ahead. I follow up really fast. I wanted to see, because I feel like it, with this episode and with an episode we recorded recently with Kyla Scanlon, um, the wonderful economist, we've been, I feel like talking around this issue, but I feel like Bob is the person to explain it. Like, you know how there's the Reddit forum, explain like I'm five? Mm -hmm. um, like, can you explain in clearest possible terms basically what's going to happen with regard to Social Security? Like, what type of, like, I feel like we talked about this a little bit with Kylo. We're talking about this with you. The fact that we have a demographic crisis that is just simply making it so, like, the, the math does not work out. Like, can you explain this to, like, the real Gen Z idiots who are going to be the ones who have to bear the consequences of this, but probably aren't following this and don't understand what we have um, ahead of us coming our way. We love our Gen Z audience, oh, by the way. Yeah, explain, you're not explain idiot. to your, you're, yeah, you're, special... you're a little, you might be idiots. I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> no, but like, can you, can you explain like they're, no. maybe not like they're five, but like they're Gen Zers who've never thought about entitlements before, like right. what this is no going cap. to look like 50 years from now? Sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, so some of this might be obvious to people, but again, just to, to say it from scratch. So mm -hmm. the basic issue is the way Social Security is set up. It's the so-called pay-go system. And so every year, yeah, workers out of your you know paycheck, you see money taken out for FICA. And so that's partly Social Security. And it's, it's not that that's getting funneled into some account where they're investing in mutual funds on your behalf. And now that's growing at interest. And then you know when you retire in 30 years or whatever it is, they're going to start drawing down on this separate account that was earmarked for you. That's not at all what's happening. They're spending the money as soon as it comes in the door. And then, like I say, they're issuing to the extent that they you know, are borrowing from the, that. If they if they spend more on Social Security, what they used to do, excuse me, is the government had more coming into Social Security than they were paying out to current beneficiaries. The federal government was borrowing that and just giving Treasury bonds like to say, we're good for this. We, you know, we will pay you back uh, ever since past the, you know, the Great Recession. It's flipped. And so that actually outgoing, you know, Social Security payments are higher than what the workers are paying in. And so they've been drawing down on that, you know, those excess earnings. And so what's going to happen is eventually it's, you know, it's a point where the, the amount the workers are paying in is not going to pay Social Security beneficiaries enough. And they will have whittled away the so-called trust fund. And at that point, you know, they, they can you know, borrow money if they want. But it's going to I think what they're going to have to do is a, a combination of, you know, raising how much the workers have to kick in and cutting the benefits. And one way to reduce benefits is to delay the retirement age, right? To say, hey, hey. people are getting older, they're working longer. So instead of you being eligible to start receiving benefits at this, when you're 59 and a half or whatever, then maybe now we'll just, we'll bump it back a few years. So that's, I mean, it, part of, you know, what the heck's happening big picture is because the population's aging. Okay. So hey. if you look at like a 1950 and say how many workers were supporting, you know, a, a given retired person, it was a different number than what it is now, right? So each worker now is re is supporting effectively more retired people than was the case 50 years ago. And am I correct in believing some of this is because like the baby boomer generation is a particularly large generation uh, right. compared to, you know, Gen X millennials. But also some of this is due to the fact that like people simply aren't having enough children, right? R right, or, yeah. And or we're not letting enough immigrants in to make it so that like we have a large enough workforce to be able to support this massive generation of old people. Right. So everything you just said are all contributing factors that, yeah, even if the birth r and death rates had remained the same as they were since 1900, the fact that there was that big influx of births, you know, right after the war, is that bulge of the baby boomers moved through the system that was going to cause problems. But yeah, on top of that, you've got declining 
birth rates, you know, longer lifespans, except for the, you know, the recent vintage of, of, you know, uh, life expectancy dropping in the U S. And so those two things put together just means, again, it just as the population on average gets older over time, you know, of course each member gets older, but the, you know, the point being that if there's people are living longer, but there's not as new, new people coming in as much at the, at the front end, then over time, the whole system gets older. And so, yeah, if what happened, if the way this system works is people between 20 and 64 are working and they, every year, the amount we take out of their paycheck is what we pay to the retirees. Yeah. That system becomes less tenable as right. the whole, as everybody gets older on average. And so that's, yeah. that's and what's just going to be on. Cl- just to clarify one thing on that, you know, there there's the baby boomers and then the millennials are the sort of ends of the barbell there. And then Gen X is a small generation in the middle. So right now it's sort of working because there's so many working age millennials, but it's us millennials that have dropped the ball in terms of, you know, procreating. And so that is where the demographic turn is coming. And so Gen Zers, the advice here is you're not going to get your social security at, you know, age 65, maybe not even age 90. So like start trying to get out of that or, you know, agitate to keep some more of your money now. Um, But I, you know, Bob, you're arguing uh, for sort of that the government should engage in the kind of responsible budgeting and accounting that a household or a business would the modern uh monetary theorists say that is completely wrong that it that it's it's a totally different game um and even the keynesians like jason Furman, uh they're wrong they they still think that deficits matter a little bit they don't matter um we've pulled three clips from the TED talk given by Stephanie Kelton, who is kind of the high priestess of MMT. She's she's an economist. She's written multiple books about it. She was an advisor to uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign at at some point. Um, And I want to play some of these uh, clips from her talk just to introduce our audience to the concepts uh, behind MMT and and have you sort of give your answer to those concepts. But before we roll it, I'll just mention that, you know, Bob has written lengthy articles, done very long podcasts on the subject. So uh, we, we'll link all of that as well if you want to go, you know, even deeper into understanding what this conflict is all about. But this will be a good introduction to MMT. So let's roll that first clip, John, where she talks about why deficits just don't even matter at all. Deficits have gotten a bad rap they're almost always seen in a negative light. And I would like to change that. There's another way to think about government deficits. Just as a six becomes a nine, when we view it from a different angle, a government deficit becomes a financial surplus when we look at it from another perspective. A deficit hawk might look at this picture and see nothing but a sea of worrying red ink That's not how I look at it. Here's what I see. I see what's happening on the other side of the government's ledger. When the government spends more than it taxes away from us, it makes a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. Their red ink is our black ink. Being responsible shouldn't mean running the government's finances like a household. Instead of trying to keep the deficit in check, Congress should be focused on keeping inflation in check. That's the real limit on spending. And it's the thing to watch out for. Okay, so just like, you know, you turn your head and a six becomes a nine, you flip this graph around and one man's deficit is another one's surplus. What is wrong with that general analysis, Bob? Okay, so yeah, I'll try to be be succinct here. So one way I, I I try to get this across is just to say, in her just that analogy or that that particular statement, there was nothing special about the U.S. government. You could likewise just say, you know, people, the shareholders of a certain Google or whatever, are worried if if Google runs issues more bonds. But if you think about it, you know, someone in the private sector, you know, owning a bond issued by Google, that's you know an asset to them. And so really, as the deeper Google goes into debt the wealthier planet earth minus google becomes mm-hmm. so really we should all be you know cheering every time we see a particular corporation issue more bonds because that's asset 
and you wouldn't, you know, normally talk like that. You say, yeah, I guess that's true, but you know, that's that's not the way we talk. So there's nothing special about the government. And then what's interesting is if you push it and say, no, no, but really the federal government is is different from private companies in, in many respects. It makes the case worse on their part because right. So right now the you know federal government owes the the public what twenty twenty eight trillion dollars all told, and you know including the Fed right. or whatever. Okay. So should the rest of us view that as a, as net assets and like, oh, this is great, given all the land and buildings and brain surge and all these other assets that we have on top of that, there's this U.S. government that owes us 20, but it's 28 trillion. How are they going to come up with that to pay it to us? They're, if they tax it, they're sticking guns at us and saying, give us that money or we're going to throw you in a cage. Right. So that's not clear that I should view that as an ad, that the, the private sector's whole should view that as a net asset or they're going to print money. And again, so here we get into our different economic views, but in general, the U.S. government creating $100 bills is not making planet Earth $100 wealthier with each bill they print, I would argue, right? And so that's, I mean, it's a, if a mugger, you know, some guy owes you $1,000, he sticks a gun in your belly, says, give me $1,000, you get, hand him the 1000 and then he hands it right back to you and says, now we're square. If that's what you thought his debt to you was, you wouldn't be walking around thinking this is a $1,000 asset if you knew the way he was going to pay you back was to take it from you through force. So again, the fact that the U.S. government, in a sense, owes the rest of planet Earth twenty-eight trillion or whatever, that doesn't mean the rest of planet Earth is twenty-eight trillion dollars wealthier. If the U.S. government just disappeared on that score alone, it's not that the rest of planet Earth was oh now we're we're that much poorer. There's also something very telling, I think, about the way she finishes that little chunk of the TED Talk talking about how, like, well, inflation is really the thing that we ought to be concerned about here. And it's like, well, what is the means by which you will be able to pull off that? The amount of government spending without creating infl- rapid inflation, right? Yeah. Like that, that feels a little bit unanswered or underexplored. I mean, I would imagine she goes into more detail later, but like, you know, that's a risk that you run. And I feel like the last few years have been a great case study in sort of discrediting a lot of the MMT yeah. hypothesis. What do you think of that? Like, is MMT basically discredited now? <laughs> I mean, so I certainly I I think it's done poorly. Now I hear the different MMTers said different things, but Stephanie Kelton, since we're talking about her. She was definitely doing talk shows, you know, like, like, you know, CNBC, those types of interviews uh, in like 20, let me give me time, like 2022. You remember when, when price yeah. inflation really started picking up and some people were worried and then others were like Krugman were saying, oh no, it's transitory. Don't worry. It's a supply okay. side bottlenecks. Don't worry. We don't, we don't want the Fed to tighten too aggressively. And so Kelton definitely was doing those shows saying this is transitory. Don't, don't worry. So she was clearly wrong at the, you know, in real time misdiagnosing how bad it was going to get. And then, you know, we had the highest price consumer price inflation since the late seventies, early eighties. And they, w- I have never seen any MMT person saying, okay, yeah, we did overdo it there, but we're just saying as a general rule, these right wingers are still, you know, gold bug, orthodox fuddy duddies. I didn't see anyone saying that. So, you know, it made, yeah. it was understandable in, you know, 2016 when price inflation by normal metrics was low and interest rates were low. That the oh, MMTers you know. were running victory laps saying, aha, guys like Peter Schiff, and if they knew me, Murphy, were <laughs> raising false alarms. But as of 2022, 2023, it was the mirror image where a lot of MMTers and conventional Keynesians also had been saying, don't worry, folks, the Fed's got it under control. And they were wrong and inflation ended up being a much bigger deal than they had been leading them to believe. Yeah. Okay. And just to give the fuller context on this TED Talk, this was in October 2021. And so she's giving this in the context of we just did all this p- pandemic spending and look how great it worked out. We just need to keep we need to keep doing that. Like the pandemic, at least that initial round of pandemic spending in her mind, that proved the premises of MMT. And we just need to like step on the gas at this point. So like in her mind, what was the the Bidenomics approach was, uh, you know, the right direction, but not fat, not fast and hard enough, I guess. Uh, I, I want to talk more about the um, the issue you were raising there, Liz, though, with um, inflation and uh, money printing, because in this next one, she explains why having a fiat currency, which is not backed by gold or anything like that changes the equation and makes it so you you have a lot more flexibility to uh, embark on the kind of policies she would like to see. So let's play that and get Bob's explanation and reaction. MMT provides an accurate description 
of how a fiat currency, like the U.S. dollar or the British pound, actually works. It reminds us that we're no longer on a gold standard, so finding the money to pay for the things we need is never an issue for countries like the U.S. or the U.K. As the issuer of the currency, the federal government can never run out of money. It can afford to buy whatever is available and for sale in its own currency. Now that might mean spending on roads and bridges, a military arsenal, or hospitals and schools. Finding the votes to pass a spending bill can be hard, but finding the money is never a problem. They just create it. Everything's done electronically, so there's no physical printing of money involved. If you got a $1,400 check from the federal government earlier this year, or if your company received money to help cover payroll and other expenses, then you received some of the newly minted digital dollars that were created to support our economy. No taxpayers were involved in that process. It was all done using nothing more than a computer keyboard. So is she right that thinking of government spending as using taxpayer dollars to fund things is somehow outdated? Well, she's not. Okay, so there, like the, the fundamental point she was hitting, and, and the name of the documentary, the the, the pro MMT documentary that basically followed Stephanie Kelton around the country, was called "Finding the Money" for that reason, right? So the, their right. central insight is that hey, in these political battles, when we're worried about should we have single payer health care or a Green New Deal or putting you know bases on Mars, let's stop saying how can we pay for it or can we afford this or where will we get the money. Let's just say instead, is this going to cause too much? price inflation? like, Or do we want to divert real resources into these ends? And so on that narrow point, yes, that's true. But when it's not that people thought, oh, literally, we had no idea that they could just print money. We, we had no idea, right? That, I mean, this, like Murray Rothbard's, you know, a, a great author in the Austrian tradition, his book, Mad Economy and State, that came out in the early 1960s, he had, and this wasn't something he invented. This was standard among free market economists to say there's three ways the government can pay for something either through taxation, borrowing, or printing money, or, you know, it's, it's inflation, which is basically, a, you know, a, a, a hidden tax, mm -hmm. right? Where, where, you know, they say outright taxation, borrowing, which is like deferred taxation, or inflation, which is hidden taxation, right? That's the way you talk about it. So everybody has known for a long time that the government can, quote, pay for something through creating more money. And the mm -hmm. issue is just that doesn't make it free, that just makes it harder for the public to understand what's going on. And so it's kind of deceptive. So they're just, you're saying that she's actually acting as this, as if, as if, as though this is some sort of new insight that is uh, like historically governments have done this for it, decades, right. if not longer. Um, and, you know, can right I use now, my favorite, the way. Can I use my favorite analogy, Zach? Yeah. On this real fast. So. And people, if you're an Austrian type, you're going to think this is funny. If you're an MMT or you think this is the stupidest thing ever. But so the analogy I use is like, imagine if you have a, a husband and wife sitting at the dinner table and always in these stories, the husband's the buffoon and the wife is the, the shrewd one. And they're arguing over their budget. And the wife's saying, I just, we can't afford this. We got to stop going out to eat so much, given what our respective salaries are. We just, we can't. And the husband says, no, 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 stop talking like that. We don't have a budget constraint. I can just put a ski mask on, take off the shotgun and go down to 7-Eleven and rob them. Now, it's true. I'm not saying that's a panacea. I eventually might go to prison, but let's stop talking about we don't have much money. Of course we do. I can just go rob us. You see what I mean? So right. The question yeah. is, <laughs> did the husband just help the conversation? And did he really, you know, is, was it was good that he corrected his wife who kept right. erroneously saying we don't have the money to afford going to, you know, Disneyland yeah. this year? No, that's goofy. So likewise, when people are saying, how are we going to pay for the Green New Deal? They mean it's going to be, you know, if we divert resources there, the public doesn't want us doing that. Yeah. That's not in our national interest. They don't mean literally, how could we come up with enough hundred dollar bills to pay for that? Yeah. <laughs> but if I can get to what I think she's, uh, you, I think that's a very important and valid point because um, the, it, it's almost like wrapping this really s simple statement in 
this as some sort of profound insight when really what she seems to be saying is that this is what the government should be doing. Not like I discuss it's not really like she discovered that the government can print money. It's like I think the government should just print money to pay for these things. Because right now we we talk about the government printing money, or as she points out, you know, just adding to the digital ledger money. But it's not as though that's exactly how it works. I mean, the government first, and you can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the government first borrows money by issuing treasury bonds, which then people buy to lend the government money. And then there's a process whereby the Federal Reserve can work with the treasury to create money. But there's this it, there's this whole series of steps that have to take place before just printing money. And and that seemed to be like at the center of that of the MMT documentary is like, well, why don't we just print the money and not go through the whole, you know, borrowing charade? What is your answer to that? Why shouldn't or why doesn't the government just print the money? OK, yeah. So I'll answer this in, in stage. So you're right. In, in terms of like the hyper technical point, that's what's so ironic about this is the MMTers will often retreat and say, this is just accounting guy. We're just telling you how the world is. We're not recommending anything. It's just you guys don't even know how the world works. And no, if you like read Stephanie Kelton's book, for example, and you're right, it parts in that MMT documentary, they at least were very misleading. She says things in her writings about like, oh, when the, if the government wants another you know, 100 fighter jets, the treasury just instructs the Fed to credit the account of Lockheed Martin or whoever, but by this amount. And, and no, yeah. that's not true. By, by <laughs> statute, the, the the treasury cannot over you know they they can't bounce a check as it were, or they can't spend more than's in their account with the fed okay yeah. just like you know i i can't instruct bank of america to pay the grocery store more than's in my checking account okay yeah. so i don't spend a ton of time dwelling on that because that is just a you know they they could a congress could change that tomorrow if they wanted yeah. to so i don't want to make it but i'm just saying even yeah. on their own terms. If we're just explaining how the world works. It's actually not quite right. What yeah, you said, that's not how right. it works. But First, it seems like yeah. that's how they want that's how they want it to work, though. Right. So I mean, so what happens? I mean, it's kind of a shell game. So what happens in practice is the Treasury, yes, officially issues new debt, you know, new bonds. The P the primary dealers, you know, give them the money, and then the Fed may end up buying a lot of that from them in the secondary market, creating new money that way. So it's kind of a shell game to the extent that if the Fed's balance sheet goes up by the exact amount of the deficit, you can say indirectly the Fed monetized the debt. But strictly speaking, the way Kelvin her writings talks about how it works is not correct. But then more generally, if you're saying, uh, you know, sh should they go through that charade? Like, wouldn't it just be more straightforward if when the government wants to spend more than it wants to tax in a given period, should it just create the money for, you know, right out of the gate rather than going through all the stuff about issuing bonds and the Fed monetized da, 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 da. It's one could be up to there's two schools of thought on that. So one hand is just like that might open up the floodgates even more. And maybe you're concerned about doing that. But on the other hand, it might not be more transparent. Right. So I actually know some right wing Austrian hard money types who say, yeah, as much as I don't like, yeah. you know, I don't want to give uh, Nancy Pelosi the printing press any more than I want to give it to, uh, you know, uh, Powell still when in, when prices go up at the grocery store, if you could show, well, this is because Congress is spending all that you know money, like it might be easier oh, to pin the blame on an on accelerationist uh, uh, approach to it, huh? Right. Like so, that. so yeah, I'm not here. Money like, printer go burr, so people Here's, know what yeah. happens. There's, yeah. there's I like ways. the chaos of that. There's something fun. <laughs> I do not, not like the chaos of that. <laughs> there's something richly satisfying about attempting to connect consequences in a more transparent way, right? Yeah. Are you are you willing to uh, go out with wheelbarrows full of currency to experience that uh, thrill? <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about inflation because there's one more Kelton clip I want to play that addresses the inflation aspect, which she mentioned in the first one. Um, in this last one, she says that the only constraint, the only real constraint to government spending is how many actual resources are available in the economy. John, could you roll that clip? Congress should be asking, how will we resource it? To answer that question, think of people, factories, equipment, and raw materials like wood and iron. If we're going to build high-speed rail, fix crumbling infrastructure, and green our economy, then we'll need concrete, steel, and lumber. We'll need construction workers, architects, and engineers. We'll need companies that can fill 
thousands of orders for solar panels, EV charging stations, and electric school buses. In a full employment economy, all of the resources you need are, well, fully employed. There's no spare capacity anywhere in the system. So if the government suddenly tried to make all of these investments at once, it would quickly discover that it doesn't have the people or the building materials to do the work. To get the resources it needs, it would have to compete with the private sector, bidding up wages and prices. That would be inflationary, and it would be fiscally irresponsible. We are a long way from full employment. We have the resources we need to begin repairing our broken systems, but we have to believe it's possible. So, in this theory, then the only real check on government spending is whether or not. There's full employment in the economy because then you're competing with the private sector and causing price inflation by the increased competition. What do you make of that now that plank of MMT? Right. So again, though that by itself that doesn't justify resorting to the printing press, right? You could just say in general, yeah, tax more or borrow more and, and spend. And then government, yeah, if, if there's a, a depressed economy, the government can issue a bunch of debt and, and spend that way, like a conventional Keynesian. And so yeah. Yeah, even on, narrowly on its own terms, I don't think that that's justifying, you know, resorting to the printing press so much, but more generally in terms of like just basic disagreement about how the world works and how the economy works, her viewpoint would make sense or the you know, standard Keynesian view like a Paul Krugman would make sense if you thought the free market or the market economy, let's just say, left to its own devices, could get stuck in a rut where for years at a time, resources remain idle. But at least in the Austrian view, the, the reason we have these boom bust cycles and you do have periods where unemployment is high is because of a prior inflationary boom, right? So it's not just the market on its own gets stuck in a rut. It's because of prior government intervention. And so re really, even if it were the case that oh, yep, right now there is a bunch of workers at home and they can't find work. You don't fix that by saying, let's have the government come and just make up a bunch of jobs and direct them. I mean, that's that's central planning. Just no, let the market sort that out and then the workers will get placed in a more sustainable long run niche rather than having somebody like Stephanie Kelton working with other people saying, well, we could just take some steel and some con concrete and some construction workers and we could go do this and green the economy. I mean, ultimately, you have to rely on prices to coordinate all of that and having just a bunch of people in Washington coming up with grandiose projects that you're, you're trying to mix two things together that don't really mesh. So as far as I know, um, there aren't any open MMTers in the government um, or, you know, advising, uh, you know, people who are making decisions about the economy. I had mentioned before that Kelton was uh, an advisor to Bernie Sanders, but the actual government economists kind of trip over themselves to distance themselves from MMT whenever I hear them talking about it. I guess what I worry about and why I wanted to have the conversation about it is that these ideas can almost get like adopted in like sort of implicitly sometimes um, if they're just like floating out there in the ether. I guess my final question on, on this MMT section is just how influential do you think MMT actually is and has the potential to be so i can answer you this way as you may know tom woods and i years we had this podcast called contra krugman and we retired yeah. that at some point and partly was just because he was kind of saying the same old thing in our view but yeah. also i don't view the, the old school you know keynesians really as the cutting edge anymore in terms of if i'm a fan of the free market and hard money or sound money whatever term you want to use to me, the threat is no longer the Keynesians. It is the MMT crowd. And really? you know, the, the way I had a book review of, of you know Kelton's book when it came out, I'm paraphrasing, but I said something like there's good news and bad news. The good the good news is Kelton's book is surprisingly glib and she's very a very funny writer and clever. The bad news is, and I just repeated all those same things, meaning because I think she's so wrong, it alarmed me when I saw how charming she could be, right? Like I I can, you know, her document that documentary is very well done. If I believed in MMT, I would think they hit a home run with that. It's very compelling. I'm sure you guys may have seen the thing uh, with um, 
the the guy that was tripping all over himself. Oh, what's the guy's name? Christina Roman Bernstein, Jared Bernstein. They had on saying. Why does the government issue bonds if they can just print money? And he clearly didn't know the answer. He was just walking around in circles on camera. So I, I think that's part of the exact, to go back to what you said. Yeah. I think the standard government economists kind of know they're dinosaurs and all the cool kids are running with it. I mean, the MMTers are saying, we you know, look at it, it's all lollipops here. We can just print money until we see prices rise. And in 2012, 13, 14, prices weren't going through the roof. So it seemed like it was fine. And then even after COVID, well, I was supply bottlenecks. Don't worry about that. You know, just keep keep your eye on the prize. We can get free health care or universal health care and Green New Deal. Just print money. Don't listen to these old white men with beards. This idea of the Overton window shifting in such a way that MMT economists are now something we encounter all the time in the wild. Um, so you sort of shifting your own mental framework from Keynesians are the ones we're sort of fighting against to MMT or so the one we're fight- ones we're fighting against. Is this a good or a bad thing, right? Because on one hand, I feel like MMTs are the far more drastic, radical, concerning types. So from your perspective, does that make it easier to win the argument against them because they're so far out there and so radical? Or does it make it harder because the thing that they're peddling is fundamentally very appealing to people who don't think about these things very deeply? Yeah, it's, I understand your question. Who's the opponent that you want to pick, the Keynesians or the MMT? Right, right. So, so again, so for me, the reason I picked the MMT is because I I could sense that the, this is going to be more popular going mm-hmm. forward with, with the masses at least. And then, like, I think even AOC and maybe some of the other more progressive people in Congress, there's this, and, and, the, and in their own terms, sometimes they do make, you know, they say stuff like, well, why can't we come up with the money for this? Well, when we had to invade Iraq, nobody was worried about how we pay for it. And so, on their own narrow terms, they're, they are right that, like, the right. GOPers yeah. are hypocrites when it comes to some of this fiscal austerity stuff. So I, I get it. And it can, you know, that does sound very persuasive if you believe in what their causes are. So I, there is that element. I mean, to answer your question, it's much harder to debate an MMT or because they're just, they're coming at it like, like Paul Krugman and I, especially if we drop the shtick and we're like, just actually talking to each other, like we could even agree on a model and say, okay, this is what it would look like if one of us won the debate. That, that I guess that's the way if we, we at least know what it would mean to lose the debate. Whereas the MMT are, you could think you just blew them up and they're just like, what are you talking about? I'm just crushing it. And you're just, you can't even understand where they're coming from. Yeah. So there, there is it's, an element. So the point's not there. They're, is it possible that them. they're just so stoned out of their minds? Like, have we considered that possibility? It's hard yeah. for them are to come they, back down Are they earth. fans of reason? I don't know. It's a, <laughs> oh, hey. we're going to get to, we're going to get to our little beefs in a second here, Bob. Let's um, hold, let's hold so your horses. It, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there are, I don't want to come off as being too cheeky. There are some. Oh, oh, you don't. You're, you're, no, you're, you're, no, not at all. There are some, a kind of like Randall Ray and others in the MMT camp, and, and Warren Mosler is a very charming, smart guy. So I don't. They, I can understand why they're building up such an audience and, and a yeah. fan base. I'll put yep. it that way. But, but yes, it's in terms of trying to. It, there was a thing where Krugman actually went head to head, I think, with Kelton, and he was saying they're playing Kelvin Ball, right? And I understood More. what he meant by that. That he would sit there and win the argument. And they would just change something. It was like, what are you, what are you doing? We said we were going to hold that constant. We and so yeah. there is that that element involved. And you know, I don't. Does that mean it's a fool's errand to debate them? I don't think we can ignore them because then that just allows them to say they can't debate us. They they're they're afraid of us. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, I know Rothbard had this line about how economists used to be the sort of grouch at the picnic who was yep. telling the government officials, you know, this is the reason why you cannot spend. And then they started to figure out that if they could rationalize a way for them to spend more, that they would advance in their careers to higher and higher echelons. This is a, a cynical reading of the economics profession, but perhaps uh, an, an accurate one. And if MMT is like the next mutation in that process or something, then maybe you're right to be anticipating this and we can you know, give ourselves nightmares about MMT or steering the ship. We can also... Dream of a day when the government starts putting Austrians on the Council of Economic Advisors. So, you know, if you had the the ear of the Fed chair or the Treasury Department, I assume you'd be whispering something like end the Fed in their ear. Um, What what would you know, what would you say is the most urgent task at hand if you were there, um, you know, at, at the the arm of power um so i think reducing government spending in terms of all the mm-hmm. different things because that's ultimately what's driving all this stuff 
that given that they're spending that much, they have to finance it somehow. And again, whether they tax people, borrow, or print it without going through those two routes, eventually they're they're directing you know, when the government spends money, it's directing real resources away from private sector uses. And to me, that's the, the critical thing. And the other stuff, the, the financing is in a sense almost an afterthought. So that that to me, yeah. that would be the, the biggest deal. And then just, you know, unleashing the private sector. So things like let let the private sector compete, right? So if it comes to like, uh, geez, the healthcare sector, you know, get rid of regulation, allow, allow people to buy drugs that aren't FDA approved and, you know, maybe put bright warning stickers on them saying, this is not FDA approved, take it your own risk. But that's the way you immediately just make things much more affordable for everybody is a lot of these restrictions on supply. Um, my, my last, uh, I want to move us to a slightly different topic, which is a discussion of some of our differences. Mm -hmm. uh, some portion of our audience, I think, views us as coming from different camps of the libertarian movement. You're affiliated with the Mises Institute, and you like to give us reasoners a hard time on X.com sometimes, including this recent back and forth with uh, Nick Gillespie, uh, uh, what where... <laughs> You said that uh, Nick was giving, uh, speaking at a, a Students for Liberty event, I believe it was, uh, kind of giving an optimistic case for why we're, we live in a freer society than ever in some respects. And you're, re, you were saying that you were, had just been at a, um, a Bible study where the only disagreement you had with your buddies was over how much time is left before... It's a total police state USSA. And then uh, Nick's reply was, I'm sure we can agree on some of the negative trends of the last 50 years. Uh, I trust that you two, you also applaud uh, many trends that suggest mass human flourishing, such as increases in global incomes and life expectancy. And he kind of linked to human progress. And I know you and Nick, uh, Nick was on your show and talked through some of this, so we don't need to belabor that in detail. Uh, th these are some of the, you know, human progress data points that he was referencing. You can see, you know, an increase in food supply, uh, global population living in poverty going down, deaths from natural disasters going down, uh, world gross product going up. So there, there's definite, you know, material gains. But um, I guess what I found interesting about the back and forth is that it highlighted one important divide among libertarians, which is this kind of doomer versus maybe doomer versus optimists is mm -hmm. productive. But those who focus more on the, that material progress and then those who see who are kind of uh, focused more on the uh, downward trajectory. Wow. So like without making this about you and Nick specifically, sure. how fundamental do you think that particular difference is when we think about the libertarian movement writ large. Right. So let me just say at the outset, I understand that there is a, among people, like let's say in my camp, that there is a, a knee jerk defeatism and pessimism where if anyone says anything positive, like, hey, Malay won. And they're like, oh, he's just a tool of the CIA. Or, you know what I mean? Like, in other words, like anybody who might smile means you're either a fed or an idiot. Right. So I understand that. And Why I'm, not both? Okay, you could be both, right? <laughs> um, and, and so, especially with their standards now, right? Um, so, so I let me I acknowledge. I understand why if you're coming from the more optimistic, especially like if you know, younger people, like it, you know, you, I get that. Um, that's actually uh, someone uh, got me to go to a Bitcoin conference once, and they said you should go there because they're building things. It's not like a normal libertarian conference where everyone's just complaining about everything. And so I was like, oh yeah, that is, that would be nice. So. Um, <laughs> So I, I agree with that. But having said all that, yeah, I, I think right now, I mean, the reason Nick's statement shocked me when I saw it, when he was saying there's no better time to be a libertarian or something like there's no better time to be, I forget exactly what he put. But he, yeah, around the world, like, you know, China is, is liberalizing in certain places. But my point was that among like the UK and the US and Canada, to me, they're ushering in a, a big brother you know, police state that's, you know, run on technology. And I, I think there's not, you know, in our lifetimes, we're going to see, in my view, drones going around and people will just know if you get out of line, your neighbors aren't going to know what happened to you the next day. And, but, you know, I, I think that that's, that's coming. And so, uh, you know, just, just to be talking about reductions in average tax rates or something, 
I, I don't I don't I think that's that's missing a big part of the story. Is government incompetence a bulwark against that surveillance state being effective? Like, what do you make of that argument? Uh, I mean, it, it certainly helps, but it's, you know, somebody who was sitting in the gulag under Stalin would not be chuckling and saying, aha, he doesn't know how to plan, you know, central to plan an economy. No, but I mean the inability to even get the people to the gulag, right? Like, But I mean, they were able to do it a long time ago. So I, I, I'm saying that they're able to accomplish certain things uh you know within their the the, the zone of what they want to do sure. so I, I don't think it's just they're a bunch of you know bumbling fools and they can't like they can't get anything done sure. do you think so, that's so, I mean, another think, divide? Yeah. you think that's another important divide is that that some libertarians in your view are too they believe the government is too incompetent they don't uh understand like that uh, when it comes to executing really malicious plans that yeah it it still could happen i mean this might be t too simplistic but i think like the movie the matrix is a good <laughs> metaphor for what i think is coming that yeah there's in one sense like you know imagine you wake up neo you know you, you pull him out of it he's like you guys are in a spaceship that flies around that's way cooler than the method of transportation we had you know back when i was in the in the simulation and so there's various structures in which you know, Morpheus's crew flying around, they're benefiting from all this advanced technology. But on the other hand, they're in a dystopian world. And yes, they're able to evade it. So I think, you know, going forward, the, the true innovators, the people that are, you know, encrypting their messages and they're using blockchain based financial transaction things, they're going to be able to evade the authorities where. But I think the general population is going to be more and more herded into like, oh, we're going to have UBI and you guys are just going to be plugged into your VR headsets. And don't worry, you know, the, the robots are going to build everything and 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 that I think, you know, the population is going to keep trending down, that, that that's in all these people's interests to, you know, it's easier to maintain a smaller population. So I think that's that that's what is in what the agenda is. I'll put it that way. So you right. believe that we basically will live in the pods and eat the bugs and be plugged into the VR headsets, essentially? I think the average earthling... Right is that's what they're, if things don't fundamentally change, that's what's in store. So yes, the people who see it coming and are clever and whatever, I think can evade just like, you know, smart yeah, you know, well, Mises fled from the Nazis and got, got to safety, but it's not like, so if you think about it, the Nazis really didn't do anything because, you know, socialism doesn't work. But there is, I think also an interesting, like some normies, it's, it's almost like we're going to see this, um, this greater fracturing than ever before, more and more splintering. Where I do hear what you're talking about, of like, I'm very concerned about the sort of alienation and loneliness epidemic. Um, and those types of people using all kinds of balms for the weary soul that I definitely do not approve of and think uh, are diametrically opposed to the good life. But there are also so many normies who it seems like when faced with the ability to technologically opt out of the world around them actually choose not to do that. Um, like we've seen the uh, Meta's plans for the metaverse be basically a massive flop because there's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of normal people who see that the things that are most worth caring about are the embodied, the tactile, the community building, the, the the time spent outdoors with your children, right? And so I feel like there is possibly backlash brewing. Maybe that's just my optimism speaking, where there's a lot of normies who are not going to be super interested in the sort of tech mediated world that our overlords would have us live in. But I'm curious about whether some of the divide between our two camps of libertarians comes down to something that Zach and I've talked about with Dave Smith before at, at pretty great lengths, which is like my default explanation for a lot of awful government behavior tends to be more incompetence, whereas I think Dave's camp tends to be more malice. And I wonder whether that would describe you, Bob. And and then there's also this thing which I think is related, which is Rothbard's idea of like, do you hate the state? And like, I don't walk around spending much of my day feeling extreme rage at the state, but I think that there's an entire camp of libertarians who perhaps do, and, and Rothbard's words there really resonate. Do, does that as a map of where libertarians approach this issue, does that make sense to you? Or do you think there are any blind spots where I'm getting it wrong? No, I mean, I think you've sketched out the, the territory fine. And yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. Fine. Rothbard. Not better than fine. <laughs> what? Earlier, you guys referred to the previous economist as the wonderful. And I'm wondering what adjective you're going to use for me. That's um, <laughs> so, yes, it's. So I I don't that that Rothbard essay I mean I guess you know it, it's a disembodied thing so I I try I don't try to to hate people right in yep. general like so not to get mad at them and I think 
you know, I'm a Christian. So in one sense, I think everybody is a sinner who deserves hell, except, you know, for Jesus saving but, them. And so, yeah, I don't walk around thinking oh, I'm such a better person than Klaus Schwab and those guys. I can see how you would end up in that spot, you know, uh, going and thinking you're helping. Right. And everybody <laughs> makes compromises morally and whatever people in all different positions of authority. So I can see if you're walking around as a global leader with that much responsibility and thinking no matter what I do, thousands of people might die and I got to pick the, you know, that could, I think that would mess with you, you know? Mm. And so I think that's heaven, but I mean, look, I'll just, we're running out of time. I'll be blind. I, I think there are global networks of people that are, you know, running pedophile networks. Right. I mean, let's just say that. So that's, that used to be a crazy thing. And then with the Epstein stuff, people are like, Oh yeah, maybe that is true. These are not people like you and me who just got won an election. Like I think behind the scenes, there are some very dark forces if you're, you know, not in the spiritual stuff, fine. But I, I think there are some malevolent forces at work. So yeah, the average person working at the IRS, I don't think is a monster. I just think that's a job. It's got nice security. They, they fell into that, and there you go. Maybe you know they're they're supporting their kids. But in terms of the people, the higher up you get, I think they know that what they're doing, you know, they're they're lying to the public, and their goals are not what they tell people their goals are. I think it's pretty wild to bring up the global cabal of pedophiles right at um, one minute before we have to wrap. But yep. I do feel as though you're dangling wonderful meat right in front of us to tackle for a future episode. So I, I'm sincerely hopeful that we'll get to do that, Bob. Let's okay. ask the final question of the show to you, Bob, which is what is a question that you think more people should be asking? Uh, why hasn't there been more investigation into the Trump attempted assassination? That's a very good question. Bob Murphy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.